let, let, let's pretend that you are serious about this question and this isn't just a journalistic opportunity for two heads of one very selective school and apparently one less selective school, uh, which is what Charles has told me just now. Um, and you're trying to work out what you're trying to do for your child. Um, and when you come to think about your child, your child is going to be very precious to you. And you're trying to navigate the opportunities. Now, children aren't born with vision statements. And I have yet to meet a parent I've wanted to keep as a parent who's got a vision statement for their child. But if you do, were to write one, the idea of value is always going to be what are the potential for childhood? What is, is, is the childhood going to be something which is distorted by or made possible through education? And a lot of us feel uh, that give any process, given undersupply of places and oversupply of pupils, then the distorting impact on education and also on childhood is really quite great. So I hope that what you can do with a, an independent education is play your cards right so that the things that matter to you as a family, the things that matter to you deep down, are the things that happen that really operate well. And I always say that I'm not entirely sure that I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm doing is a big punt because I won't know whether it's worked until the children are in their 30s and they've got good relationships that they are holding down jobs that they're enjoying and finding fulfilling and they are happy, agreeable people who are not obsessed or unhappy or depressed. And I'll be pushing my Zimmer friend at this point and all the mistakes I'll have made will have already happened. So I live my life as a head thinking, what can I possibly do that adds value to a child's life in their potential of becoming fully human? And trying, if anything, to put a firewall around the least helpful aspects of a child's experience. And my sense is that running an independent school, which is effectively what we're talking about, an independent school tends to be one which is funded by parents rather than by the state, is one way we can make, outside a very bureaucratic organisation, you can make a lot of decisions about how long you teach, how long the school day is, how long lunch is, what do you do, um, do you have exams at this point of the year or not. And you can do all sorts of things, and so I think that there is value in extending childhood and removing distorting impacts. So that's my start of a 10 and Patrick has now had time to think about the question and should answer better than me. I couldn't hear a word that Adam said, so um, can you hear? Sorry, it's, yep. it's, um, I heard the last bit which I very much agree with, but I want to be slightly controversial. I think the reason we're back is with, um, we, were, we slightly stirred things up last year um, and we very much enjoyed um, debating and challenging each other. I think I would turn the question on its head and just say what is the value of education? Um, I think there are a lot of independent schools that aren't worth the money, um, if I'm honest. And I think that you've got to, just because you're paying for something doesn't necessarily mean it's better. I think the really important question is, is, is getting the right school um, for your child. I and mean, the benefit of independence is in the name of independence. That's all the reasons that Adam gave that we have the freedom to do all sorts of things that, sadly, um, in the maintained sector, by and large, um, they are much more constrained, although we're seeing that being freed up with the academisation movement and then with what Theresa May has said in her green paper, the great meritocracy speech and ideas about grammar schools and whatever. So for me, yes, obviously, I think there's great value in the right independent school, but I think it's terribly important um, particularly on events like this where you look around, fantastic schools, all with glitzy marketing, fantastic hands out. It's very difficult to really get inside and to find out what the reality is of the education that you will provide. And Anthony Selden, who spoke earlier, that many of you have heard, gave you some very good things to be looking out for in terms of choosing the right school. So for me, um, obviously independent education is worth it, all the reasons that Adam gave, but actually, um, if I'm honest, um, I would like to see the maintained sector at such a high standard um, that it was even more difficult for independent schools to flourish and survive. And there's something controversial for you, Adam. I can't hear it. Sorry, I really can't hear it. I, I think it might be easier if, I, yeah. if we, we talk from here, if you wouldn't mind giving your responses from the top. If, if resources are 
finite as they are for the majority of the population uh, in terms of not being able to fund a, a, a full independent education from reception all the way through to, to, to 18. Do, do you have any views on key years that might really benefit from independent education more than, more than others? I think it's a very sensible question to ask yourself. Uh, because if you are wanting to put your child into ed independent education, um, I'm not sure that it's actually any better to hear me from here than from down there. Can you just wave if it's easier to hear from it than here? Okay, right. Well, I can hear you now. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's obviously important, Patrick. Um, um, yes, okay. Oh, well, that's even better. You can move these. Oh, that's rather good. Um, um, so if you're trying to work out I mean, my school runs in three schools in one from three to 18, and there are a lot of families who are choosing to come not at three, not at seven, not at 11, but to come at 16 and at various other points. And I assume that they're making those calculations in the terms of what is available. So I think at any point you're going to be saying, to answer this question of when is it valuable, when is it worth it, you're going to be looking at what the free equivalent is. And that is going to change hugely according to where you go to school, or where the child is. In North London, um, Primary school education can be excellent and you can sometimes be sure of getting into the school which is local to you and you can walk your child to school. Um, the, we're, we're working with a, we're setting up a, a sixth form academy just as Patrick's school has done um, in Tottenham, in the eastern part of Tottenham. And there it is a bit of a lottery whether, where you live, whether you get to the school you want to go to. And so it really can mean that not only could you not get the courses you want, but you're not actually going to a school which seems to have the right emphasis on what you want. So I can completely understand why you'd be saying, limited resources, what are the opportunities? I don't think it's really possible to say to you, would you be better off choosing a school if you only had four years, which four years you had, unless you were actually sure about what was the alternative that was available to your child. So I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit and say, it seems to be a good question to be asking. Um, what I would do is say that this does allow me to, to beat the drum on one particular thing, which is that every stage of education is important. And there should be no hierarchy in your sense of what matters, whether it's A-levels or GCSEs. And one of the things I find with parents is that the bit of education they remember most is the one, is the sort of the prism through which they look at the quality of a school. So I quite often, when I'm talking about 7 plus or 11 plus entry, and I find I'm being asked, you know, how many people do you have going to Oxford and Cambridge? And I don't mind giving that information, but there is a suggestion that the outcome, that the end result, where children are going to, is the most important way of measuring what's going on. And every day, every lesson does need to matter, which is why in a school like ours, North through, through School, we pay the same amount of money to somebody who's teaching three-year-olds as to 13-year-olds as to people who are 18, because it is just as skilled and it is just as important. So I, I, I would I would edge away from it, but I would still say that I think um, that, that the value question is one I would be asking all the time, um, and I think that Patrick's point, um, and which is really tedious to agree with him, uh, on this occasion, unusually, um, is correct. And I just want to make one point. I'm really pleased that I've moved centre stage now, because that means that all the photographs that are taken of this speech can't be like last year, because I think I'm actually here in order to provide light relief for um, Patrick, because in all the um, advertising, um, Patrick was there on one side, and all there was was text, and I disappeared. So I, I, I just want to remind you that I'm the head of Highgate School, and my name is Adam Pettit, and while Patrick is great, I'm as lovely to be sent to stage for once. <laughs> Actually, I agree with everything that Adam's just said. I mean, <laughs> we're going to be really boring today. No, I mean, he's absolutely right. I mean, it's a crazy question if you have finite resources. I mean, you, I mean if, if you're child is doing well in, in, in a maintained school, in a local school, there's no reason to change. There really is no reason to change at all. And I, I strongly believe that. And I think it's really important that you look very carefully, as Adam said, um, at the local alternatives for you and make a choice based on that. Um, the problem that we have, you know, highly selective school, pretty selective school, um, they're becoming more selective, um, Highgate trying very hard, um, is that, of course, my concern is that we, the danger that it plays into the hands of those who have money, um, who can coach, who can provide tutoring, uh, and for me that's a great sadness because all our schools want to be as diverse as possible and as open as possible, and I have very, very mixed feelings about tutoring and that whole culture. There's, there's something awfully wrong about over-preparing your child who then struggles 
um, and lose the self-esteem and confidence in the school they're in. And whenever I talk at prep schools and primary schools on these things, and, it, and, it, and I've gone through this with my own children, just relax and let your children find their own <clears throat> level and let them be their own person. You're not living your life through your child. You've just got to allow them to find their right level and they will flourish. Uh, and wherever they go, it's the right school. Um, they will do you proud and they will leave as confident young men and women um, ready to do good, having learned all the important values in schools like Highgate and Westminster and all great schools, both in the state and independent sector, represent. I mean, this, if we, if we could ask you to stay on the list, because you've now brought up this critical point of the value of highly academic selective schools. Your underschool has what is arguably the most competitive, stressful test for seven and eight year olds in the English speaking world. So, isn't it the case that if you're going to have these huge values attached to academic selection. Parents will always want to tutor children. You, you can't stop that. You are the cause, not the effect. Well, me personally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because, because last year, you, you, you gave exactly the same talk. How, how, do you think tutoring has declined in London as a result of your warnings last no, but year? I, but I continue to argue why it should decline. Uh, but I do think it's really, really important. And I do think, and I think I were, we were both quoted in the papers last year. Are there any journalists here, Adam should have said, when he first started to speak? Um, but we noticed last year that we were being misquoted in the paper the next day, and people picking up sound bites. But I will continue to say that you shouldn't shoot your child. Yes, of course, I understand um, why people feel that they need to do so. But I'm a great believer that one day we will discover tutor proof tests. Um, and I'm determined before I leave Westminster to have found one uh, that will genuinely recognise potential and ability rather than somebody who's had the money uh, to pay for their son or daughter to be prepared to a certain level. Um, and I'm not sure I'd agree that Westminster Under School was the most competitive school on the planet. Um, but again, there's nothing wrong. In the English speaking world. English speaking world, a modest qualification, very good. Uh, but I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with selection. I don't think, I think it's absolutely right and appropriate that bright children should be taught together. Um, and I think that, that, that that's a wonderful thing and I think Adam would probably agree with that as well. But it's not just the academic progress. Of course, what dis dif differentiates the great schools, uh, particularly in the independent sector, is of course the things that are happening outside of the classroom. Because I'm passionate that the lessons that your children will learn outside the classroom are as important as the lessons they will learn inside the classroom. Because their character and the way in which they're going to develop is hugely important. And the other really important point that I'm always stressing is the education doesn't stop when they leave schools like Westminster and Highgate. We're just part of that lifelong journey and we try to inculcate and put the right sort of approach to learning within the children so that they'll go on at university and you don't stop your learning progress at university in the working world as well. And that to me is the test of a great school, that they've learned the right habits of work, of scholarship, um, and that they've learned the importance of failure, they've learned the importance of setback, they've learned the importance of coming out of their comfort zone and, and really giving it a go. It's great standing up because I can just keep going and going, but Adam's desperate to come up. Adam. No, I can just see the boredom um, that was uh, <laughs> creeping over people's eyes and they're twitching to hear somebody from Highgate. Um, Jumping into where you are, thinking about us here having this fairly puerile debate about whether there should be selective schools or not, and whether Westminster and other schools like them should are um, hypocritical in having very selective tests. I think the, the situation I find myself in is that I am most often, as a result of uh, London becoming a place with more people who are looking at independent education, uh, facing larger and larger numbers of uh, people sitting tests, and also finding that I'm now nearly almost offering a place to a child who's got almost invariably four, five, six, seven or eight other offers um, and therefore in a, in a position to make choices themselves. So what I do is I emphasise to parents that I think that schools across London um, are much less different than we think they are, although there, there clearly must be differences, um, and the children are adaptable and flexible. And I said this last year and I'm going to carry on saying it until I, until I drop dead. Uh, well, no, I'm stopping ahead, which I hope don't coincide. Um, but I'm going to be saying the children are flexible and adaptable, and they will be—they will do well in good schools. 
Um, you know, I went to a state school, there was one school in my town, and I had some good teachers and some teachers who were not quite so good. And what, what really made the difference, I think, was parental expectations and that they coincided with those of the school and the good teachers. So in making those offers, I then sit back with great anxiety. I make more offers than I have places because we are quite selective, not as selective as Westminster. Um, and what I do then is I really hope that the parents who then choose the school are in sync with the values that we have as a school. Because that parental alignment with what you're trying to do as a school um, and uh, what the school is doing is really important. The children will be happy come what may, but parents, we are not flexible, we are not adaptable. You have very strong views about most things. You are intelligent, sentient human beings. You must have strong uh, opinions about things that matter, and your children matter. So de facto, you will care about education. You have also been educated. And so you either loved your school or are different to your school or hated your school, but you will have feelings about it. And so therefore you will look at the way the school is run. So I think that sense of whether they're selective or not, that is what is, what is happening and you should be looking in that particular context. And don't forget that non-selective schools, schools that choose not to be selective, can be brilliant. And it's not in the nature, to my mind, of whether a school is selective or single sex and other things I have to talk about or co-educational that matters. It is the quality of the school. And that's what you look at when you go beneath marketing and you go and visit people and you talk to parents. You know, are children there, generally speaking, happy in the way they're spending their childhood? And are the teachers ones who look at the child when they walk through the door and engage with the person and then think about what to teach? Or do they start teaching regardless of how the children feel because that's the next lesson in a row? Thank you. I mean, it, it, you may think it's a pure art. Uh, dis discussion this head monster. But actually, I, I spend a lot of my time in Asia and Westminster particularly leads the way because parents think the best school is the school which is highest up in the league table. So I don't think we're quite addressing the question because on the one hand you're saying that academically selective schools are right. I don't understand why. I mean, you, you would need to qualify that because there are streams in most schools. But on the other hand you're saying, well actually, if you're happy in a state school, stay there. What, what, what is the value in having groups of boys and girls who are all selected academically. And on, on the measure of, 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 of untutorable tests, well perhaps, but are those tests going to select creativity? Won't they discriminate against creative children? We we'll stand up together on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you've, you've asked two different questions there, made two different points. Um, if I were to make a justification for there being um, a selective education um, and thinking that selection were part of our ethos. One very practical reason is that without selective schools, I don't think that you can attract academically minded graduates into teaching in the first place. And that's a really important aspect of what we're doing, is that we are getting those people to come into this country. In so what is your evidence for that? So the people that, um, if I'm comparing the um, quality of people who uh, are attracted into teaching in my school, compared to the quality of uh, the qualifications that people I'm seeing in the state schools which I'm helping with, they are very, very different. What about, what about non-selective, less selective independent schools? Are you saying that no. a, a, a less selective independent school of which there are, are, are hundreds here attract I'm going to disagree with that because, uh, sorry, I mean it's quite important. I mean, I, the most important differentiator in schools is the quality of teaching. Um, and it's absolute, the tinkering with school structure, the type of school, is irrelevant. The most important thing is the interaction that happens in the classroom between the teacher and the young person. And that's where I disagree with Adam. It's not, I, don't, I don't think that's right, what Adam has said, or I would certainly challenge that. I think in both, all schools, anybody who's ahead wants to attract the best possible teachers, because they're the people who are going to do the transformation, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, I understand why Adam said what he said, but I, again, I, I agree, I, I would like to see much more evidence of it. Some of the best teaching that I have seen has been in non-selective schools. Uh, where people naturally uh, differentiate, they bring out the very best of the young people in front of them. It's really quite inspiring. Um, teaching at schools like Westminster and Highgate, you, know, you might think is more straightforward, of course, you know, but it's challenging as well because the children are innately bright and challenging and questioning. And for me, the, the, the other differentiator is that schools like Westminster, of course, it's very much in the liberal education tradition of that radical questioning tradition, which is what we're trying to encourage, what all of us as parents want. Because you shouldn't be obsessed with results. The results should come as a byproduct of the quality of the education. It's everything else that is happening to them within the classroom that's important. What I'm surprised Patrick hasn't said is that very selective schools 
and normalise children who are off the spectrum in intelligence terms. And I think there is there a role there in terms of what well, my experience of teaching very, very selective schools is that ability, therefore, for children who are in their, their IQ test, whatever it is, you know, 140 or above, are actually made to feel normal and are able to see that they are working alongside other people and developing emotionally along the way. Um, in terms of the argument about whether or not there should be selective schools, whether they're in the state sector or in the independent sector, and be highly selective, I think that most people would say that the degree of selection, uh, over-selection, actually goes too far and is not the product of what schools are setting out to do. Our liberal vision for what we are trying to teach isn't predicated only on the fact that children have to be very narrowly selected, but the nature of the market is such that we can't operate in any other way. Why? Because if we were to um, start to do, I mean, if you look at the um, means by which you test um, other qualities or decide not to be a selective at all, um, you're going to go to other things that you're going to be looking at. So you'll be looking at their character and their um, things which might otherwise be very difficult to detect. And you're shaking your head there with this sort of... No, hang on. You're talking about a liberal arts education in the same breath as talking about psychometric tests. I mean, how can you measure the psyche in metric terms? It's a bit of a cop-out, isn't it? No, I don't Relying on these, these verbal and non-verbal reasoning tests, which are I discriminatory. I don't think they're... They, they, they discriminate, no, I don't like discriminate against people who are slow processes, for a start. But I mean, I think that we, we select children when they're two and a half um, to come to our pre-prep and children at seven. And clearly, the moment at which you are processing those things, you are having to take into account what you can do, what is presented to you. So clearly, we can't um, process very much two and a half other than their ability to, to sit more still than other children when they're going to be three. And that seems not to be discriminatory um, in any way. So therefore, you're just saying, what is the least discriminatory way that you are going to be able to say? And to say that, to, to assess... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Look, I, I think parents might be rather surprised to hear that a way of selecting someone for the next 18 years of their life is whether or not age two on a particular day they can sit still on Well, it's possible not that they're, they're, you're, you're taking a sound by which well, that's I what you just said, isn't it? Well, I do tend to don't say things in answer to your rather yeah. aggressive questioning, which I yeah. think actually is which is interesting, but on the other hand seems to fail to understand that when, when you're do, going through a process which takes actually two hours rather than just a particular um, time, you've got psychologists based tests which, as it were, allow you to say, are we sure that these children within the four years that we're spending in the pre-prep, would they be happy? Um, and can we be sure that the accelerated education which we're offering would be right for them on the basis of our experience? You see, the, 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 the reason I'm being quite strident about this, call it aggressively like, is because we're on the receiving end of hundreds and, and thousands, actually, of parents who are very, very stressed in London because you guys have such academically selected no, no, schools. No, no, that they're, they're not, as I said at the beginning, as I was trying to explain um, to parents, that I think that the over supply of children, if you like, and the under supply of schools, um, is actually going to create an, a, a, a situation in which there are not enough places. Um, parents, well, whatever the test, you expect there to be some kind of test if it's not a lottery, and even a lottery doesn't make it any better. Um, therefore, there is that sense where it is up to us to manage in the best way we possibly can. And we can see the market responding. There are schools now opening in London which were not there before. Now, I completely agree with Patrick, you need to go and check whether new schools are good schools. But in the state sector and in the independent sector, they are doing that. They are responding to the market. And to hold the schools which existed before the demographic change to account for the processes that used to not annoy anybody um, seems to me to be um, rather sidestepping the economic and geographical issues which are going ahead. Well, of course, I could be do, you, do you think that your founders were, would be surprised to hear the word market? Market in what sense? Well, you're, you're talking about a market for places. I mean, you're, you're, I, I thought you were a charity. I mean, wh why do you have to uh, uh, follow them? Well, we're following our values, and we are completely true to, certainly in our case, yeah. when the schools we founded in 1560 to the wishes of Queen Elizabeth I, that we're educating, as it then was, 44 boys for the greater good of the state. And that, to me, is fundamental to everything that we're trying to do. That we're trying to inculcate the right sort of values that the people who benefit from Westminster education realise the privilege that they've had, and with that comes the responsibility to give back. So, would you agree with Mark Bailey, uh, High Master of St Paul's? He, he yesterday said that St Paul's is a, is a special educational needs school because it's it's catering to the needs of uh, uh, exceptional academic students. Would you say the same about Westminster? Well, we sort of Adam just basically said the same thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, and I think it's a, it's a very important thing. And I, we're not normalising bright children, but we're allowing them to spark off each other. Let me give you an example. Many people have seen in the Times yesterday um, an article about our free school, Harris Westminster Sixth Form. Um, and that's a fantastic experiment um, set up 2014 
collaboration between the Harris Federation and Westminster School to provide a Westminster education free of charge within the maintained sector, a selective sixth form. Um, and it, it, it's almost like the United States of America, it's an experiment that cannot be allowed to fail. And we're thrilled with the success of it. Here we are in year three, the first cohort, um, seven places into Oxbridge. But we've set as, our pre, uh, as the key thing on the admissions criteria, um, that when it's oversubscribed, which it always is, that the key thing is if they pass the admissions test, priority goes to children on free school meals, pupil premium, and we're just under 50% of the school. So we're genuinely reaching out to the disadvantage. And the interesting thing for me is I've just come back from a weekend with 11 Harris Westminster pupils and 11 Westminster pupils at the Gladstone Library. And it was fascinating, to, you know, a wonderful um, discourse on what is liberal education um, and talking about the role of faith in contemporary Britain, etc., etc. But talking informally uh, between the two groups, the fascinating thing was that for some of these pupils, it was liberating to come to a school where they could be their own person, where they could actually be proud to be bright. Um, and that to me is the real sadness that in some areas of this country, um, children cannot be their own person. There's nothing wrong with being bright. There's nothing wrong with being creative. There's nothing wrong with striving for excellence, whatever area it happens to be. And I cannot abide the fact that you know, all our young people in this country cannot flourish to the best of their abilities and that there's so much of a lottery in terms of the education they're provided. So anyway, I could keep going on, but Adam, back to you. I'm sure we're about to be attacked again in your views. Well, let's, let's, let's ch change the subjects a little bit, because uh, uh, unless you have anything more to well, say. I think, I think it was, um, Patrick has talked about uh, Harris Westminster, and I, we are um, opening, as I said, this school in Tottenham, where 80% of children in the east part of the borough go outside um, Harringay in order to get their A-level education. So they're clearly looking for something which isn't being provided. And we are setting out to offer what we regard as the best facilitating A-levels to get them to Russell Group universities. And the choices start with the A-levels you choose, because some universities don't look at some A-levels with, with, with much admiration. And the key to that is going to be to transfer an understanding of what an academic liberal education can be, which can be provided for free. And so we are helping to provide that to state school, but with us putting in um, five full-time equivalent teachers going across from our school and bringing in seven other independent schools to do that. And that is going to be selective. Now it's going to be selective at a lower threshold not to put people off to start up, but it will be unavowedly selective on the basis of GCSE results. And one of the things that I am seeing is that in getting teachers to come and teach there, they are teachers who do have a thorough academic mastery of their subject and can inspire young people to say, if you study in these ways, the world is open to you. So the first day will open with children going to visit universities and saying, these are yours, because these are children, generally speaking, who don't move outside their own home patch very much. And say, these are not the playground of the middle class. These are schools, these are places which you can go to, whether Oxford or Cambridge or Imperial. They are there for all of us. Your taxes and the previous pay, you know, generation taxes have paid for them. And it seems to me that if you're asking about my founder, Roger Chumley, who was really worried about whether he was going to go to um, hell or not, and whether it was, but it wasn't acceptable to talk about purgatory, so he set up a school instead. But he was providing a school for poor boys. And I think that while we're talking about boys and girls, however we'd use the term poor, we are living through our educational charity, albeit we are generating the money from running a fee-paying school in order so to do. Thank you, Rose. You, you both talk about uh, this liberal education. Um, could you just expand and describe and define it a little bit more? Because that, that, that's really the heart of this, isn't it? The, the value of a liberal education. You're standing first. Go ahead. Okay. I think when I'm, when I'm talking about a, a liberal education, I'm talking about the ability to look, um, and I'm going to use terms you already hear, holistically at a, at a, at a human being and work out um, what is the humanizing influence of study. And I, 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 I sense and know, of course, that there is a utilitarian, utilitarian element to study. But I do fundam fundamentally believe that children, people are born good. But that in order for children to become good people and to strengthen that, those, that goodness needs to be strengthened. And it needs to be strengthened in many ways. But one way is by study. And the exercise of the mind and the exercise of judgment and the exercise of being able to entertain ourselves in, in debates like this and make difficult decisions requires there to be real content and it's to be presented in a critical way where there is no right answer, where you're being presented with something where you have to form a view. But having views of itself is not going to be um, enough. It's got to be founded in reading and understanding of otherwise minds so that you can train your own mind and then come to a critique of that. 
And that's, so that the sense is that education um, has a profoundly moral purpose in making people good people. And I think that's how I would say I'm trying to run the school, and that's why and how we make decisions about the relativities of the, the balance within a curriculum. I wouldn't add much to that, except I think it comes down to um, the underlying philosophy of the way in which you are encouraging your staff uh, to interact with the pupils. And I mentioned a few moments ago um, that for me, the crucial thing is empowering the young people um, to be questioning, to be challenging, uh, to be radical in their thinking, to respect other people's points of views, and to allow them to have any opinion that they want, as long as it's based on sound thinking. And I have to say, this isn't a sales pitch for Westminster, because obviously, you know, as you've just heard, we're the most oversubscribed school in the English-speaking world, which I shall use in our advertising literature now. Um, but for me, um, the, the really interesting thing is we're not teaching to the test. And yes, we can have the confidence not to do that, but we're taking beyond that and, and getting them to think about the really big questions. And why I have great, this is my 22nd year of headship, and why I have huge optimism for the future of this country is that in my time as a head of three very different schools, I've become increasingly impressed in recent years about the way in which young people um, want to think about the big issues. Uh, they want to be uh, talking about things that are making a difference. Yeah, and here we are, people of my generation, both here and in the US, of course, have really made life very difficult for the younger generation in all sorts of ways by recent decisions. Um, and it's very, very interesting for me the way that they have responded to those things, the way that they have interacted. So everything that Adam said, you know, I would agree with. But for me, it, 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 it's, it's empowering them to question, to challenge, um, and to really be thinking about their own destiny in, in, big, in the bigger picture. Um, and it doesn't really matter what they think as long as it's based on sound thinking. And going back to this weekend I've just come back from, and again it was really heartening just to hear them reflecting um, on those important lessons that they have discerned both at Westminster but of course at Harris Westminster which is just into its seventh term of existence. Already they recognise that that is what is the transformational nature of a liberal education. Thank you. If we were to be a little bit more, more functional in addressing this question of value, do you, do you think that, uh, that the values you've been described are fully recognised by British university admissions officers, by employers? What's, what's your experience of that? Yes. <laughs> um, I'll try a bit harder. Um, I, I think, I think when, when I read the um, invitation and what it was, which has changed several times, um, clearly as the conferences, gone on, or the, the show has gone on. Um, I think there is an anxiety amongst uh, parents who've got their children in independent schools, whether there is a, um, a perceived antipathy towards or bias against children applying to universities in the United Kingdom rather than to the US, um, if, they haven't, if they've not been in a state school. In other words, if you were to um, apply from Highgate with, and uh, to a particular university, required to get an A star, miss the grade, um, perhaps required to get an A from another university and then get a B, B um, from another school might be let in. So that, you know, there is that, that kind of prejudice there. And I have to say that um, we have uh, 160, 170 pupils every year applying, and although there are the odd occasion of the, the appointment, over time I've seen no um, persistent discrimination. It's only flared up once or twice in certain departments, and when it's been challenged across the whole sector, one's found that perhaps there was something that wasn't quite right. So I think that... Um, uh, it, is, it is probably true that any system that any university devises in order to try and work, to try and find the best possible qualified, the best, you know, the best raw material there, um, whether it's um, interviews or tests, whatever, we tend to find um, the independence so that we get better and better at doing that. So I don't mind universities looking very carefully at people in the state sector saying, how can we show sure that we're not missing anybody? But I have not found any of my pupils um, being um, disadvantaged by the education they've had or the reputation of the education they had. And I would agree with that and I, and I get very disappointed with the press trying to stir up their bias against people from independent schools. And of course the trouble is that there is no homogeneity to the independent sector. And of course a lot of, uh, there are pupils in independent schools who are on full bursaries from very disadvantaged backgrounds. So it's too simplistic that whole debate. Um, about the, the, the school background. And most universities are, are getting quite sophisticated at actually recognising that. So I've not seen a problem in my time with it. 
Yeah, and to be honest, there is an argument, there's a school of thought that if you have two equal candidates, one from a top independent school and one from a school in the maintained sector, um, why shouldn't they take the person from the maintained sector? Um, and the point that I'm always making throughout my time with the three different schools I've been at, that you've got to be better than good if you've had that benefit of the education that's being provided. You've really got to demonstrate um, that you've really seized the opportunity um, and made the most of it. And the thing that gives me the greatest pleasure on a daily basis at Westminster is that the overwhelming majority of Westminster pupils demonstrate that by what they do. Um, and I think it's a wonderful thing and a real privilege for me to be involved um, with young people with that sort of outlook, vision and aspiration. Do, do, do you think your school would be much more valuable if you raised far more bursaries? Well, we are asked for far more bursaries. Well, uh, keep it back to the that we are needs blind and we're working to create a yeah. genuine needs blind approach, which I think is critical mm -hmm. um, because I would love to see um, a Westminster education open to anybody who would benefit from it. Of course, if, you know, the highly selective education that we're offering isn't going to suit everybody, as Adam suggested earlier, and that's important that you choose the right school for your child. Um, but if it is the right school, then it is obviously a fantastic opportunity. But my old school is here, Pangbourne College, um, very different sort of academic school, but it changed my life you know, because of my educational background. Um, and you know, I had a very difficult schooling, very difficult, but that, that school, and I can't thank it enough what I wanted in terms of character development and opportunity. Yeah, and I certainly wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for the benefit that I got from there. Transformational, two or three transformational teachers, great opportunity, um, and I was the only person to go to Cambridge for many, many years, and here I am, headmaster of one of the great schools in the world. And this is really difficult, I can't even hear myself speak. It's getting worse and worse. So no, so, yeah, I'm, yes. It seems to be rather noisy. That's fine. Right. No, no, no. Um, big, just big, one, big, one final question before um, we open it up to, to the floor. I'm, I'm very pleased you touched on Pangbourne because the, the show has many boarding schools yeah. here. Do, do you, you, you have boarders as well at Westminster. Could you talk a little bit about the, the value of, of, of boarding uh, 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 rather than day or you know, not just boarding for functional reasons but for the, for the value of it in itself? Yeah. I mean, most people don't know that Westminster is a quarter boarding and actually we run as a boarding school. So we're six days a week. Um, and actually, to be honest, if, if the best thing to do is go to our website and look at the two videos on boarding, which give the best reasons for boarding I've ever seen. And our lower school, bright, sparky, challenging young men, um, list the top nine reasons for boarding. And you know, number one, well not quite number one, is to escape from their mothers. Um, because uh, the nagging mothers um, and, and, you know, and then things like you know, no commuting, that type of thing. So huge benefits from the extended day and the extended week. And Adam touched on this much earlier because we have that freedom, you know, the length of the day, the length of the week, um, and, 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 it, and it's hugely beneficial. So for me, boarding changed my life and, you know, and I'm passionate about it. Difficult family background, I needed the stability that boarding could give to me um, and I benefited hugely from it. So I'm a great advocate for it, but again, it's going to be what's right for you, uh, for your child and for you as a family. Uh, and I would never say that one type of education is better than another. I certainly wouldn't say that single sex is better than co-ed. I wouldn't say that boarding is better than day. Um, there are great schools and there are some pretty rubbish schools, some pretty mediocre schools, and it's just getting the right one. So Adam can't comment on boarding, though I'm sure he has views. Would you like to? Highgate has no borders. <laughs> no, we, have, we, we used to have them and we, we closed it down and introduced co-education instead. Um, I've taught in boarding schools um, and I think it comes down precisely to what Patrick says is that the difference between boarding and day, pretty obvious to work out, um, is whether they're well run. So a well run boarding school will be brilliant and a well run day school will be brilliant. Um, and it's going to come down very much to your personal circumstances, what's right for your child and for you. I don't, I don't hold this idea that children resent being sent to boarding schools um, if it's part of, if they're part of the, uh, making their choice, clearly the school I'm running has people who don't want to go boarding because they've chosen a day school. Um, so I talk about the positives of day schools, but not to suggest that boarding isn't good. Thank you very much.